great, uh, he's a great resource. Um, he is going to moderate this session. Hopefully, he's going to be uh, useful uh, for the rest of us. Um, he's CD. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the moderators. I'm just going to introduce our moderators, uh, Dr. Susan Harding from Drexel University and Dr. Uh, Bill DeLong from St. Luke's Hospital. Uh, so thank you for being a participant in this and uh, moderating. Uh, so we're going to try to keep it uh, as educational as possible and to the point. Um, and this can be a very complex, nuanced topic, uh, but to make it high yield, uh, I think it would be best if we went with three cases. Uh, each case highlighting either a, a basic principle that we would want to follow or a, um, a controversial or a not well known uh, topic to discuss. So uh, hopefully this will be helpful. Uh, there are some audience participation slides, so uh, if you guys wouldn't mind clicking or raising your hand, if uh, just to get a sense. Okay. So uh, here are the learning objectives. Uh, we're going to learn how to appropriately manage a case of a suspected pathologic fracture in a patient with no known primary tumors, understand when you can proceed with fixation or when a biopsy is needed, and understand basic principles of managing apparent and pending fractures. My disclosure. Okay, so this is the first case. Uh, case one, 71 year old male. He has a history of renal cell carcinoma treated with uh, nephrectomy five years ago, and he develops new onset of left thigh pain. So these are his x rays. He's got um, a lytic lesion in the distal third of his distal humerus. It's exquisitely painful to touch and weight bear. So um, he was uh, admitted to the hospital urgently. So to the moderators, want to sort of ask, you know, additional imaging needed. Is there anything else that you'd want to know or want from this patient? You want to start? Sure. Um, my, my dad would be mad at me now because he always said ladies before gentlemen. But <laughs> uh, yeah, um, certainly. Um, so you have a patient that had a history of something that can provide metastatic lesion. Um, and um, you have a dangerous lesion uh, that is very susceptible to failure. Um, you have to look at these um, as individual problems and know that this possibly could be metastatic, but it also could be uh, something de novo. Um, I would um, want to have um, an MRI of this <coughs> limb um, to, to get a better look at this and the soft tissue around it. Um, and then uh, after evaluating that, um, I probably next, because of the history of renal cell, um, would get an angiogram to see um, if there was any excessive uh, vascular supply in this region uh, before I um, <clears throat> move forward with the, the beginning of treatment. Okay. You know, you think, I mean, this kind of probably is assumed, but we always should say, like, if you're sitting for your boards for the residents and stuff, that you want to see full length films of that, that bone, you know, like, we don't see the hip and stuff like that. You know, so. Great. Yeah, so uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, you're worried about renal cell carcinoma, but you're not really sure because it's a first lesion that's been described in five years. Uh, the, uh, the, the additional study that you want to talk about is CT staging study to see what the tumor burden is for this patient. Uh, so in this patient, he had an MRI done, showed no real soft tissue mass, and an angiogram that showed that it was a little bit vascular. Uh, the CT staging studies were negative for other metastatic sites. Can I ask you a question? Please. Because obviously, this is the guy with all the knowledge about this, so we're, <coughs> we're just here like pawns, right? Um, but. Um, it, does a CT staging study take the place of like a total body bone scan now in your world? Yeah, no, so he got, we, they get both. Okay. They get a CT staging study to look for any visceral mets, and then they look at the bony, um, the bone scan to look for any bony mets. Oh, CT staging like chest, belly, all that. Chest, stuff. abdomen, pelvis. You're not Correct. talking like total body CT. No, 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 no. no. Okay, so uh, this, this ended up with a biopsy because a solitary lesion of bone in a patient with only a history of renal cell carcinoma, and it ended up being clear cell renal cell carcinoma. That was the biopsy. So, I'm oh, sorry. So basically the thing is, would you fix this right away or would you biopsy it? I think we answered the question. You want to biopsy it. So 69% said additional imaging. 
great. Well, that's great. No one wants to fix this right away, which is good. So to, to biopsy or not to biopsy, I think this is a question that we always have. And these are sort of the four scenarios that I think we're going to run into in clinical practice. So scenario one is a patient with a new diagnosis of cancer and a solitary bone lesion concerning for cancer. That patient needs a biopsy because you don't know what you're dealing with. As Dr. DeLong pointed to, you cannot assume that it is the same disease that you are treating the, from, the, from the cancer standpoint. Scenario number two, patient with a history of renal cell carcinoma five years ago, treated with nephrectomy, now with a new solitary lesion in the femur. This would be the patient that we're describing now. They need a biopsy because it would not be a good idea to assume the solitary lesion that he has is, in fact, renal cell carcinoma. So that one needs a biopsy. Scenario number three is a patient with metastatic lung cancer in the liver and lung, so visceral metastasis in the CT, in the CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis, but a bone lesion without ever having a prior bone lesion ever biopsy proving to be metastatic disease. That patient needs a biopsy. Scenario four, which is the one that you know, I think a lot of us deal with, but um, just want to keep in mind, a patient with metastatic disease, history of metastatic disease, let's say lung cancer, and a known prior bone lesion that has been biopsy proven lung cancer, technically that patient does not need a biopsy. Um, in those situations for the moderators, do you send tissue on your uh, specimens when you, do, when you do your fixation? Yeah, I do every time. Uh, we, uh, I think it's, it's important to document, even if you're in scenario number four, uh, I still send tissue. Yeah, I think it's a good idea as well, I would agree. Um, uh, with the new uh, therapies that are out there, with ch uh, the cancer uh, tumor markers changing over time, I think it's a good idea to send the tissue in order to gain re, uh, to re-evaluate uh, the markers, because sometimes new th therapies and drugs become available. Okay, so audience response, what do you do? People want to plate this, rod this, antegrade, retrograde, Resect and replace. So audience response, do you guys have a clicker? Okay, so 7% wanted to plate it, 10% wanted to rot it and a grade, 52% wanted to do a retrograde nail, and 31% wanted to resect and replace. So, the moderators? I would nail it with an antigrade nail, and specifically a recon nail. Okay. When you're dealing with tumor, you need to fix the entire bone from stem to stern, uh, not just to protect from this lesion, but any future lesions as well. Uh, a retrograde nail, you know, it's your first thought because it's a very distal fracture, um, but that um, uh, certainly opens up the potential for more proximal, like subtrope or femoral neck fractures in the future, so I would avoid that. And um, I don't know, the only other question I have for you, um, is there any, let's say, if, if it, well, let, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask that question because it would be a little bit different with a primary. Okay, um, and then um, as far as, um, again, plating it doesn't afford protection of the entire bone and resecting or replacing, um, well, sir, that's not in my armamentarium necessarily, but again, it doesn't. It's not really probably indicated for this gentleman in this age group with uh, metastatic disease. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I would reflect uh, what, what Susan said. Um, I probably um, I'd use a recon nail or a TFN, a cephalomedullary nail with a little more heft maybe. Um, I don't think there's any, any room for resection uh, and or bone transport or any, you know, trying to do something like that. Um, and I, I wouldn't consider a retrograde nail for this. Um, there, it's a little harder to do an antegrade nail than a retrograde nail, but it's more utilitarian. And for someone that may have a limited lifespan, um, they recover much better from an antegrade nail than they do from a retrograde nail. Uh, so um, I think you have to think about protecting the entire bone. Just, just one technical tip when you're doing your antegrade nail, because you look at that x-ray and sometimes people think, oh, antegrade's not going to be long enough, you're not going to get enough distal 
uh, protection, but you just need to take it all the way down to the physal scar. You need to stay very posterior in the distal segment so that you have the ability to take it much, I mean, you can get an extra centimeter and a half, yeah. two centimeters, maybe even three in some people by staying posterior. Yeah, there is there is one other thing that I do. Uh, this is a looks like it's contained, um, and I would vent this before I started reaming. Um, I open the, the the lateral cortex, make a hole, um, so we don't shower this person potentially uh, with uh, debris from the tumor. Um, it's um, um, just a, a habit I got into after I saw some of the um, showers um, through uh, transesophageal echocardiography from, from uh, Winquist's um, venture into uh, intramedullary uh, osteotomies. Uh, with a closed system, you're really spreading this, the marrow elements and whatever else is in that canal through the rest of the body. So venting it and keeping it local is, uh, I think, much better for the patient. So, and I would actually take that um, a step further. Sorry, is this? Yes, it's on. Okay. So I take that a step further. So generally in my practice, what I do is I address the tumor first. So I will actually consent patients for an interlesional keratage and resection of the tumor through a small incision, through something that's relatively minimally invasive, where I scrape out the tumor and treat it with either an adjuvant such as cryotherapy or argon beam, and then pass the nail down first. It's really a minimal touch technique where I'm trying to spread as little of the tumor around as possible. And uh, both for the reasons that, you know, on echocardiography, you really do shower tumor all over. And then also, especially in more aggressive neoplasms, lung, renal, uh, what have you, um, I have seen them come back for revisions where they have spread up all the way up and down the canal with endosteal disease. So treating the tumor locally and not underestimating the fact that it is a malignant neoplasm. Um, is uh, really important for these patients and shouldn't be undervalued. And this is Dr. Uh, Panzionis from Temple. She's the orthopedic oncologist here. So uh, I think, uh, I mean, these are all great points, uh, valid points, and uh, the data doesn't pan out to say one way or the other is right or wrong. So I wanted to present a little bit of data for you. So in this patient, I did an intercalary radical resection of the uh, metadastasial region and reconstruction with an intercalary uh, segment. And the reason I did this is that there is some controversial literature out there on solitary lesions with renal cell carcinoma with one metastasis. In patients, we have very, very biologically good behaving tumors. So the top part article is from um, the group out in Canada, basically showing that with one osseous renal cell metastasis, wide resection of lesion, and a history of a nephrectomy were identified as independent risk factors for improved survival in patients with renal cell carcinoma. The, pay, the, bottom, uh, the paper at the bottom from the group out of the UK, the big uh, orthopedic oncology group there, said after their evaluation, we recommend radical restriction of a solitary bone metastasis from renal cell carcinoma to achieve local control of tumor for the remainder of the patient's life. So does this mean that if we do a nail or we do a rod or a plate, does it make a difference? Many people would argue that it probably doesn't. However, there is some data out there on this, and I think it's important to at least evaluate it and ask ourselves, is a resection and replacement a valid option for a patient like this where he may be able to get another five, six years of, uh, of, um, of life, maybe even with curative intent if we actually do a good job for it. So uh, I think it's something that's just to think about is that solitary metastatic lesions, a radical metastatectomy in the bone uh, with reconstruction is an option to consider uh, in certain patients to try to improve their overall survival. Okay, just a question about that. I recently yeah. had a, a patient that was similar to this, but it was metastatic lung cancer, and he had solitary mat, and then he had kind of like a skip component two, three centimeters away in the, uh, in the bone. Um, do you only apply that literature to renal cell patients? Because I, you know, I did struggle with looking at should I do an intercalary resection on that patient, but uh, I ended up scraping him out and then just nailing him. Um, I've only done that with renal cells. Have you stretched the indication to other? Yeah, we become a little more aggressive with doing oligometastatic uh, lesions, uh, trying to be more aggressive in our resections. Hmm. Um, in your patient that you talk about with the uh, skip lesion, yeah, uh, it was sort of probably uh, 
probably not indicated, if especially it's going to be a really long segment resection. Okay. Uh, probably would just do uh, maybe intravenous curettage and a broader approach. Okay. Case number two. Uh, four seven year old male, active treatment for multiple myeloma, new onset of left hip pain and pain with weight bearing. These are his x rays. So basically, uh, the left uh, uh, proximal femur x ray just shows maybe a little bit of lysis on the medial calcar area. Uh, no grossly obvious large uh, cortical disruption, but the lesser trochanter uh, does seem to be uh, involved. So he has weight bearing pain, functional pain. And he did have a rod placed by me on the right side for, the sim for a similar thing. So question is, uh, what do you do? Would you prophylactically fix this, or would you wait? Um, if you guys want to chime in here, audience response. Um, I'm going to take the uh, ladies before gentlemen position. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are they? Are they yeah, so 86% said fix it, 14% said wait. I mean, orthopedic surgeon, so you want to fix everything? Yeah, I fix everything, yeah. right. So <laughs> why wouldn't I, why would I not want to fix it, right? <laughs> um, no, um, so obviously additional imaging and everything to mm -hmm. confirm the nature of the lesion, but assuming that it is in fact what you suspect and it's another um, uh, myeloma lesion, uh, there's every advantage in my opinion to this guy not sustaining a true fracture. That's mm -hmm. not only in terms of spread of disease locally and stuff like that, but also obviously in terms of quality of life and mobility and longevity and everything else. So uh, to fix him prophylactically, in my opinion, would do him a great service over allowing him to continue on and eventually um, sustain you know, a, 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 gr a significant complication of fracture. I'm right. going to echo that as well. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing that I think really can't be undersold is that if these people break, it's not like a normal fracture and that, okay, no worries, you'll heal. Um, you're at this point dealing with tumor infiltrated bone and you have a higher, um, if not, you know, um, almost quasi guaranteed incidence of non-union. So really these people breaking is fairly catastrophic. Um, and additionally, it's something that's a reasonable surgery now. I mean, the, the converse of that is uh, when I was doing my training in Canada, um, we had more of a push towards obviously saving OR resources and things like that. That's important here, but over there, it's just it's a have versus have not situation. And with more radiosensitive tumors, a lot of times people did bring up, okay, well, can you just sort of non weight bear the patient for a little bit, radiate it given it's radiosensitive, and give his phosphonates? Um, I think there's been a move away from that school of thought because these people don't have an unlimited lifespan, and having them non weight bearing for a significant portion of their remaining life is just generally frowned upon. So. Even if you are looking down that radio sensitivity path, it's still really indicated to fix these. Yeah, yeah I would, I would, um, I would uh, echo all the moderator's uh, uh, points. Uh, I, th but I think the location of that particularly is dangerous, and yeah. that's the, uh, some of the largest forces uh, around the body are concentrated right there. So that's, uh, that sort of uh, lowers my threshold. And once it does break, it's harder to fix technically because it's a subtrope, not a shaft, and it has a greater instance of non-union, even if you don't have tumor. So for all those reasons. I have a question for you guys, if I could. Yeah, sure. Um, can you discuss, like, the timing of radiation therapy if it's indicated along with prophylactic treatment? And sure. Uh, you know, that's your problem. My understanding has always been that, that you should fix them first, and that way the incision does better, and then radiate them afterwards, or is that not true? Um, well, I mean, there's there's two schools of thought, and I mean, you can do pre versus post-operative radiation. I generally do post-operative radiation for these. The only instance where you would have done pre is if it really wasn't a surgical indication. So let's just say you had a small tumor in the troch, was kind of symptomatic when you pressed on it, but really wasn't weight-bearing the pain. The patient had other things going on where they couldn't stop for surgery. In that, in that incidence, you could radiate and then fix if it was still um, a practical concern. Um, it does increase your risk of wound healing complications, obviously, whenever you're going through a radiated field. Um, the evidence more, uh, where I'll run into uh, questions where from a practical perspective is people will say, okay, A, do I have to radiate the whole bone? Yes, so I operate the entire field um, of hardware uh, needs to be radiated. And really the sooner the better after surgery. There's um, a paper out of the, um, the Brigham and Women's Group, I believe in 2015, that sort of outlines all of that. And they show that um, the only two really significant factors that um, influence the outcome 
for people after they've had appropriate surgical fixation is timing of radiation. So A, don't delay it, and B, actually radiate the entire surgical field versus just focally where the tumor was. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would echo a lot of the um, sentiments of the moderators um, in terms of, uh, of the panelists in terms of what we uh, see here. But um, I wanted to just go over quickly, you know, a basic principle of long bone fixation. The best guideline we have right now is Morel's criteria on when to fix. So just a, just a reminder of what that is. I want to be, I want to be clear that Morel's criteria should be used as a guideline, not necessarily uh, a biblical scripture. Because when you look at a critic, when you critically evaluate Morel's uh, rating system for pathologic fracture, you find that the site identifying where the lesion is is our best intra-observer reliability. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, it's fair to moderate at best. So the nature of it, the size is even worse, uh, and pain is actually not great either. So yes, it's a guide, but you got to use it in the context of uh, each individual patient. So this patient did end up getting a rod. Uh, in terms uh, to discuss about your radiation, uh, most of my patients get post-op radiation because uh, I want to get these patients into the operating room right away to get them fixed before they break. Uh, two is uh, radiation therapists uh, just be wary that radiation oncologists uh, are now doing single fraction radiation, one shot of eight gray compared to 10 fractions over two weeks. The, uh, the data on the radiation oncology side states that the eight gray single shot improves pain, but it's not necessarily let's say, a treatment dose. Yeah. So does your local control get worse if you're just doing eight gray radiation compared to 10 gray, uh, uh, like 20 or 30 gray over 10 fractions? So that's a question that we don't know. The second question to, to ask is the actual utility of postoperative radiation. A systematic review was done in 2016 looking at this. There have only been two papers every, ever published on the efficacy of radiation therapy in the treatment of metastatic long bone disease after fracture fixation. So no one actually really knows if it's even useful. And it's a question I think that uh, we sort of as a society need to answer mm -hmm. uh, because radiation is not without its um, morbidity. Uh, just so, uh, just to give you two papers on this, if you look at why prolifestation is useful, it costs less to the healthcare system to provide prophylactic fixation. But it comes at the cost of this paper, which on the bottom paper, which was published in Chicago, in Northwestern, showing that patients who were managed with prophylactic fixation had higher rates of PE and DVT. Interesting. So you are saving money by doing a prophylactic fixation, but are you increasing the risk of uh, DVT and PE and complications postoperatively? Uh, so these are some of the questions that are, exist in our minds. Yeah, if, and I could just add, a, you know, I don't do tumor surgery, obviously, but we do do prophylactic mailing, um, you know, in, for our cancer patients in our institution. And um, sometimes that seems to be the last event that takes the wind out of their sails. If they have, like, bilateral femoral nails or something like that, I mean, that's pathologic in and of itself for anybody, but especially someone who's already medically compromised. So I've absolutely had patients that had uneventful surgeries and just never really were able to recover from this, that physiologic hit, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think the other thing there is in terms of just patient selection. So I'm just uh, looking at the um, sort of the odds ratios and what they're describing there. Um, if you are opting not to do surgery on a patient, a lot of times you're saying, okay, well, you know, I'm looking at their um, path fracs for survival and perhaps they're less than, you know, six weeks or something like this, or there's another reason not to operate. And those patients, the thromboembolic disease may just not have been diagnosed. It's not like these people are going home and living healthy and productive lives if they're not opting to have surgery for their metastatic femoral lesion. So I think there could be a little bit of a confounder in that paper, um, depending on how they've done their patient selection. but. Certainly, we do see thromboembolic disease, and a lot of that is making sure that you identify it early and mitigate the risk factors um, and realize that these patients are sicker than your average patient coming in the door, and the anesthesiologists also need to be aware of this and treat appropriately. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, I'm please. like really picking your guys' brains, but um, I used to tell my patients, we're going to do this operation because it's going to help with your pain. And then I started really thinking that it wasn't helping with their pain that much as it, I had hoped. Correct. 
I mean, so so I've I've definitely seen that, and it's it's um, Tay can also probably comment. I mean, we have patients where their pain is not just from the instability factor, but it's actually from the endosteal tumor infiltration, mm -hmm. and that can be really painful. So um, I try and get as large a nail down as possible. And I think a lot of the times, actually, the curatage and shooting the cement up and down the canal, like a cemented quote nail, actually does better for their pain. I've also had patients where you have tumor infiltration that's sort of all the way up and down. It doesn't really look like it's going to break, but the bone is definitely infiltrated. And I've actually done proximal femurs on those patients because if you're going to be operating on them, you may as well just do the correct surgery. Um, so it really depends on the cause of their pain. If it's mechanical pain, yes, it helps. If it's more endosteal bony infiltration pain, then you're looking at more, is this patient even appropriate for an endoprosthetic and should I do that? And what percentage of pain relief will they get from just the, uh, the nail? and patient expectations. Great, um, and then the final case is uh, Dr. DeLong's case. Um, this uh, patient, 74-year-old male, unemployed, three week of left thigh pain when walking. History of metastatic lung carcinoma, bariprosthetic aortic valve, pacemaker, and Xarelto for history of DVT. Leg lengths were equal with symmetric rotation, no left side of quad atrophy, and here are the pre-op x-rays. So you see the lytic lesion in the subtrochanteric region. Um, Appears to be there's a fracture line transverse. Uh, so uh, the long, uh, you also had in here a picture of an IVC filter. Yeah, he, he had an IVC filter in place um, because of other events uh, surrounding his, uh, his uh, pulmonary malignancy and he's had um, other bone nets that were documented in um, um, I want to say it, there was one in the skull and uh, there was one in the spine. Okay. Mm. So this prompted to ask the question sort of, uh, are you getting pre-op ultrasounds for a DVT in some of these patients? The audience response? Anyone? And from moderators, are you guys getting pre-op ultrasounds at all? Sometimes. Yeah, I, it depends on the malignancy um, in a person like this uh, with a lung malignancy and someone who had a filter put in prophylactically, um, I would look uh, and I would treat him differently um, if he had um, uh, a, an active clot. So 50% uh, sometimes, 8% uh, always, and 42% never. Interesting. Okay. And do you use IVC filters? Also firm sometimes. Sometimes. Okay, good. So uh, just to re just quickly review cancer-associated thromboembolic disease. This is a, um, a great paper, uh, review paper on thromboembolic disease in cancer patients. The green is where you want to be interested in because those are the more the metastatic patients. The, the incidence of two-year two cumulative uh, VT incidence in these patients anywhere ranges from one to five percent. So it's not negligible. Uh, but there's no good data to support that patients should be getting preoperative ultrasounds uh, routinely. But it is something to think about. For you guys, is, uh, when you're treating metastatic disease patients, are you treating them differently in terms of their VTE prophylaxis post-op? I'm not. Uh, we, we treat them the way we, we treat anybody that was uh, instrumented. Pretty much anyone who's getting a femoral nail or something like that's gonna be on Lovenox or some equivalent treatment. So I think it's just important to not underestimate <coughs> that, like the increased incident, the increased risk that the cancer diagnosis brings with it and um, you know how that might affect like the length of treatment and stuff mm -hmm. like that because like if they're allowed to ambulate and they're up and they're walking around you may be you know kind of lulled into the feeling that they don't really need their DVT prophylaxis anymore and that would be something that you should clearly consult with their oncologist on that. And I think the other thing is not falling into the trap of, oh, well, they have the filter, they'll be fine, don't worry, they're not going to get PE. Um, I have seen filters clot off and people shoot clot off a filter into the lungs, so it's, it does happen, especially in these really prothrombotic states. So just being very aggressive with the anticoagulation appropriately is reasonable. Great. Uh, yeah, I do the same. Uh, I mean, they, get all, they all get um, uh, chemical prophylaxis postoperatively. Uh, I have been thinking about using kind of more the uh, 10A inhibitors. Um, I don't know if you have any experience utilizing those uh, in either trauma patients or metastatic disease patients. Uh, I'm watching. You're watching. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go there as soon as there's enough data. 
<laughs> yeah, I think that's a very Never be the first guy to jump on any bandwagon. <laughs> Okay, well great, uh, I mean those are the three cases that I wanted to review, just go over some of the basic principles. Um, so interoperability of the law, if you wanna just go through any, any uh, tips or tricks from uh, your experience? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, we, we established uh, an opening in the femur and uh, um, there's a vent hole distally, as you can see from the x-ray, uh, he had lesions um, up and down the, uh, the canal. Um, we got some, um, that's a, a forcep getting some, some tissue directly. If, if I can get to a lesion e easily enough, I'd rather take it with a, a, a forcep than um, just trying to collect reamings, um, just to, to make it a little easier for the pathologist. And uh, that's what we did. And then um, we uh, reamed him and uh, finished um, the job with a, a, a choke and charge femoral nail. And um, he did uh, obtain a significant amount of pain relief after this. Um, he, his pain was mostly with weight bearing and when he was at rest, it, it was not very significant. Mm -hmm. So um, this, this did afford him a significant pain relief. Um, That's great. Yeah. That's great. Just a question about cryotherapy. So um, I, I don't think I would necessarily cryotherapy this, but um, in the uh, number of uh, different hospitals I've had the experience in working at, um, Sloan Kettering, we had a really nice cryo spray that we, you know, it always broke and we yeah. had to replace it every three months. And some other hospitals just don't have cryotherapy. So at this hospital, I've actually found a, a long cryo probe that they use for um, bronchial stuff that you can actually thread down a femoral canal. So I haven't tried it yet, but it sounds like a really cool idea if someone perhaps did need tumor ablation sort of all the way down a canal. So what are, what are your guys' thoughts on using like a long cryoprobe in the canal? I mean, obviously not to cause a stress riser or damage to bone, but. No, no I, I, I think that would be a great idea yeah. um, if that was available. Um, I, I think you, that's little risk and uh, you may uh, make the patient much more comfortable for a longer period of time. Uh, my only uh, caveat to that is the cryoprobe. You got to look at what the, um, your radius of effect is. Yeah. Uh, some of those cryoprobes are meant to be in little, little, small pulmonary nodules. And uh, you also remember the medullary space, once you get in there, if you've reamed it prior, you may not get the full right. radius of cryoablation that you'd want in, a, in, the, in the lesion. So it's just something to think about. Yeah. Because uh, I've used cryoprobes for other things and because you don't have a substance to put it into and it's not really necessarily like this big bulky tumor necessarily, just sort of the effect may not yeah. be what you want. Uh, so these are the learning objectives. Hopefully we're to cover some of these learning objectives. Um, I appreciate the panelists taking their time uh, on these cases. Uh, I'll take any questions if you have. So principles of biopsy are very important. Um, so in general, you want to not uh, take a biopsy that's going to compromise any planned salvage um, resection. So how I sort of tell the residents is think about in the absolute worst case scenario, what would we need to do to bail this out? So in some cases, that's an amputation. But in most cases, that's OK. Somewhere distal femoral resection, you know, things like this. So knowing what your incisions would be where your planned resection would take place is really useful in terms of planning your biopsy. So always in line with that. Um, biopsying the soft tissue mass, if there is a soft tissue mass available, is always preferable. Core specimens, not cytology. Um, I try and minimize local anesthetic use, um, if uh, any, right near the skin. Don't infiltrate it around the tumor because that can spread it. Um, hemostasis is very important. If you are doing an open biopsy, make sure that you're not raising planes or exposing neurovascular structures. You want to go straight through muscle and uh, just take specimen. Um, the other thing is doing a frozen section, not just sort of taking a chunk of biopsy and saying, okay, well, that'll do it. Um, oftentimes, we can take tissue that's not lesional or that's perilesional and not get an appropriate diagnosis. 
Um, so just looking at principles of biopsy and making sure that you're doing everything safely in a way that's not contaminating and not spreading tumor and also getting you an appropriate diagnosis where you're not getting screwed for, um, you know, your subsequent surgery is important. The other thing is use of drains. So I have seen incidences where people have done biopsies in the community, um, quite good biopsies, like adhering to principles and then pulled out the drain like six inches away, like through another muscle compartment, and technically all of that's considered contaminated. So if you have questions with your biopsy, I think the key thing is we're always really easy to get a hold of from orthopedic oncology. So like call me, call Dr. Kim, you know, we'll talk to you, we'll talk you through it, or we'll have it seen in our clinic kind of like the next day and be available that way. What do I use to take the biopsy? I take a pituitary, I take a large pituitary and a curette. So um, I actually use a spinal, I'm also trained as a spine surgeon, so I, I, I'm very comfortable with the spinal instrument tray as a biopsy tray. Um, using a burr is nice. If you have to go into the bone, you want to use um, a high-speed burr and make like a small ovoid hole, not a circular hole, ovoid hole, small one, um, and just sort of curette up and down and then use pituitaries or kerosene to pull specimen out. Um, you then send it on a wet, a wet talpa or a moist talpa with saline. Yeah, um, as for percutaneous uh, biopsies, um, sometimes I'll take the uh, sport uh, grasper, really small. Uh, and just uh, make like a, like a two millimeter hole in the bone laterally, which is like a proximal femur. Put it laterally and then just stick the pituitary, uh, the, um, the arthroscopic grasper in there. Uh, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, we tell the residents and future residents all the time, uh, if you're gonna be doing a biopsy, if you can draw out the limb salvage incision and do the biopsy through that, you'll never be wrong. Um, and if you're not sure what the limb salvage incision is, you know, please feel free to call or text or whatever and we'd be happy to uh, guide you through that. So yeah, I'd just like to echo, as a non-tumor surgeon, I'd like to echo that. I was just, that was going to be something I added at the end was having a good working relationship with an orthopedic oncologist in your community is critical because I call you guys all the time and I'm like, what do you think about this? Take a look at this x-ray. And they're so gracious and they're so, they answer immediately. Um, Dr. Lackman and now uh, Dr. Kim, you know, they're just ter tremendous. Uh, resource so that you can feel more confident with your decision making. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent job. Thank, Thank you, you very much.